cry. Mm -hmm. uh, Ivan but Blazin? Is a... I think Ivan's a great guy, but I, Ivan's not a rock star. And yeah. Ivan, if you're if you're watching this, I hope you won't be, <laughs> won't be offended by that. Uh, I have a lot of regard for Ivan as a thoughtful, careful guy, but I don't know, I don't know that he's going to have the same kind of uh, emotional impact uh, yeah. that somebody like Smuts or your dad would. What's uh, the biggest church here in Southern California? Uh, the Loma Linda University Church. And who's the pastor? Uh, Randy Roberts. And does he make people cry? Um, I don't think so. I think Randy's a very capable communicator, but he's a fairly low-key communicator. Uh, He's not, at least I don't experience him as somebody who's, who's kind of playing on the, the violin of his uh, congregants' emotions. Right. I how, how much do you think Adventists got exhausted from everything in the, in the 80s? Yeah. Uh, from the, Ford, Davenport, Ray. Yeah, that yeah. I, felt like, yeah. No, I felt like I was in the middle of it. Well, whether, I think... It has to have gotten exhausting for a substantial number of oh, people. Well, I think that's right, and I think it. I think there were a whole host of people who undoubtedly said, "Okay, I've invested enough in fighting these battles. I'm going to go, you know, with Candide and tend my garden." You know, I think I think that's got to be right. Um, and then I think for another generation of folks, uh, folks closer to our age. I think it was probably the experience of coming of age during that period and saying, huh, so I could either plan on structuring my life so that I get caught up in these controversies or I could do something else. And exactly. I, think, uh, I think there have been uh, uh, more people who have taken that second, uh, second uh -huh. path. So it's not, you know, it's not perhaps a matter of having been personally exhausted so much as observing the exhaustion right, right. and uh, uh, opting for something else. Um, yeah, it's very weird, like being in the center of it, and I mean, it's a very weird human experience in general. That what is of utmost concern to you is peripheral to almost everybody else. Sure, you know, it's, it never ceases to be. Uh, but, I mean, that's the story of human existence in right, general. Right, right. That is. It, uh, you know, it is the, the story of human existence that, you know, you've been caught up in your publishing, and, you know, it's peripheral to everybody else. R r right. I, I have no illusions that even after the book comes out that I've been working on, I'm not going to have people beating down my door asking for autographed copies. <laughs> right, you know, right. That's just the reality. That's you the know, reality that's, of uh, academic publishing. I, well, and I, honestly, I mean, even uh, you know, somebody who writes a uh, piece of popular fiction or nonfiction uh, that will be read by you know a couple of orders of magnitude more people than will read what I write, even that person. Uh, you know, may well encounter lots of people who have never read what he or she has written right, and, right. you know, may not really care, you know. It's uh, it's one of the most <laughs> annoying things to deal with is um, I will walk around and sometimes people say, you know, introduce me to someone, hey, this is Luke Ford. And the person will say, oh, I'm sorry, I've never heard of you. <laughs> and, like, what am I supposed to <laughs> reply to that? You know, it's like there is no good... Right. You know, I don't want to justify... You know, and say, well, this is why you should have heard of me. Uh, I mean, that's distasteful. But there's just like, no, there's no great response to that. Yeah, you're on the spot here now. You know, does your existence matter? Uh, right, right, right. It's like, oh, I'm sorry. I know. Okay, but it's it's just so weird and uncomfortable. It's just, uh, uh, and and I I remember being like, because I was my father's son and the only child living with my dad during. Mm -hmm. 1977 to 1984, uh, like I felt like, you know, I, I was right in the middle of this maelstrom, and and yet it was it was peripheral to, you know, I hate to be so blunt. Um, I hope this doesn't get you in trouble, but you know, it doesn't get me laid. You know, it wasn't like. <laughs> The I'm definition. Not responsible for what he he's says. not responsible for what I said, but mm -hmm. to me, I hate, I hate to be so blunt, but this is just who I am. Like mm -hmm. the definition, of, you know, one of the definitions of like rock stardom is that you can walk into a bar and women want to sleep with you. 
Now, of course, being you know godly people, we don't you know engage in that type of behavior. But you know that that passion that gets you know engendered by you know controversy. Now, I'm mm -hmm. sure there are a lot of women who wanted to sleep with my dad um, from this, and you know it's like that excitement. Yeah, there's a certain kind of. Uh, you know, I mean, it's not sort of overtly erotic in the same way as Mick Jagger might be, but there's, right, there's right. an it's, underlying, there's an underlying kind of, uh, erotic tension there. Because uh, uh, that's why so many clergy get in trouble. Sure. sure. <laughs> because they have the opportunity. Right. right. Like your average schlub doesn't have the opportunity to get into a lot of trouble in that. Right. I mean, what could be more erotic in a sense than the kind of vulnerability that people often experience to, you know, the clergy person to whom they're bearing their souls. Right, and, right. You know, and looking for, for guidance in a personal way. And then at the same time, this person is up front moving people's emotions mm -hmm. and, uh, and so forth. I mean, of course that's erotic. Uh, yeah, I remember I had this one particular rabbi, Mordecai Finley, mm -hmm. and you always felt every show this morning that he was talking to you. Yeah. It's like he he unlocked my inner life like no other speaker I'd ever encountered and for other people I know my father does that mm -hmm. and and you know it's so powerful you know on some people yeah how, how would that not be a rock right, right. Yeah. and it's weird like I would you know I'd be kind of curious like which which what figure out what type of people were so moved by my father and which ones were unmoved and which ones were repelled. Like, mm. you know, it's kind yeah. of interesting to figure out what, what's the type of person that is you know, so deeply, deeply moved to their very core by what my father is saying so that you know, they're absolutely devoted to him. Then others who, it, it's, it doesn't matter a whole heck of a lot. Then others who are like totally repelled. Obviously the ones who are repelled would be on the traditional wing of, of Adventism. And the ones who are lackadaisical, this is actually easy to answer this question. Because the ones who are lackadaisical with the lifestyle of Venice, and then the ones who are really excited with the evangelical of Venice. So I guess that was pretty easy. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me that for people who had been through the same kind of You know, through a certain kind of kind of kind of formative experience in Adventism, and had hung on to that, I would think it would be enormously liberating to encounter an account of the gospel like your dad's. I think you're quite right. That, you know, that, so that the people who were the people people, if you will, for whom something like Luther's spirituality was very much alive. People for whom guilt and penance were issues, constant companions, and who really needed liberation from certain Yeah, people salvation. who worried about their sal yeah. salvation, yeah. Like, which yeah. I totally don't get, but I guess there are people. But again, I think, that's, but I think yeah. it's clear that if that's where, yeah. you, where yeah. you're living, to be told, you know, you can stop Worrying. obsessing yeah. about this. I mean, how is that not liberating? I think it's easy to see how if yeah. that's the, the dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you've, if you've grown up in an environment in which you're told God is watching and looking for an opportunity to get you, you know, right. uh, nobody would ever say that, obviously, right, right. but I think that that, that, that that became the flavor of the, uh, the experience that a lot of people had. Um, you know, to, to be given a different picture of divine grace. Uh, how long do you think? Oh, what? How long is the half life for that um, for that joy you just described? Because I can understand people being real excited mm -hmm. about that for a few years, maybe, and some people are excited about that for 50 years. But I mean, you'd think after okay, you realize I'm saved. Um, you know, I'd have to think there's like a half-life of mm -hmm. two, three, four, five, I don't know, five, maybe five years, where five years later it's half as exciting because you can't be excited <laughs> by that. You time, can't, yeah. yeah, I mean that, you know, in the end, like life is prosaic again. and.